On Saturday, May 4, 2019, the day started like any other for Iman Nasser, a 17-year-old from Manchester, England. Recently becoming a new mother, she was still adjusting to this exciting phase of her life. However, the day took an unexpected turn when her ex-boyfriend and the father of her baby, 17-year-old Rhett Cardi Shaw, called to inform her that he was coming to visit. Despite their breakup and Rhett's involvement with a new girl named Sarah Mohammed, the arrival of their baby had brought them closer again. Shortly after the call, Rhett arrived at our man's room and the ex-lovers engaged in an intimate encounter. However, within minutes, Rhett suddenly and violently stabbed a man multiple times. The question arises, what could have triggered Rhett's sudden outburst of violence? Was he under the influence of drugs, or was there a more terrifying reason behind his actions? It is important to note that Manchester, where this tragic incident took place, is a major city in the greater Manchester area with a population of 552,000 as of 2021. The city is renowned for its football clubs, Manchester United and Manchester City, attracting fans from around the world. While the crime rate in Greater Manchester was 98.2 per 1,000 people in 2019, it is also a diverse and welcoming city with a rich historical heritage and esteemed universities. Aman Nasser, born in 2002 in Openshaw, Manchester, lived in this city with her family. Growing up in a close-knit family with two sisters and two brothers, Aman's upbringing was deeply rooted in her Islamic faith. Her family regularly attended the local mosque, instilling a strong sense of faith in her from a young age. A man's personality radiated through her intelligence and charisma, excelling both academically and socially. She easily made friends and was a dedicated sister to her siblings. Her love for babies was so profound that she aspired to become a midwife in the future. However, in 2013, a man's life took a different path when she met Rick Cardi Shaw her classmate at Manchester Academy. Initially, their relationship seemed caring and protective, but over time, Rhett's behavior became controlling and abusive. As a man's relationship with Rhett deteriorated, his behavior became increasingly abusive. He would engage in flirtations with other girls, cheat on her, lie to her, and even resort to physical violence whenever she questioned him. As a result, a man's once vibrant social life began to fade away. She became withdrawn and isolated, afraid of upsetting Rhett, but also fearful of leaving him. A man's friends and family noticed the distressing change in her behavior, but unfortunately, they were unable to separate the couple. Despite these challenges, a man remained dedicated to her studies and managed to earn good grades in high school. She had plans to attend college, hoping for a fresh start away from the toxic relationship. However, at the age of 16, during her junior year of high school, a man's situation became even more complicated when she discovered that she was pregnant with Rhett's child. This news clashed with her family's traditional expectations, and her mother was disappointed and angry. Initially, a man's decision to keep the baby was met with resistance, but eventually her family accepted her choice and offered their support. At first, Rhett appeared to be happy about the pregnancy and assured a man that they would work things out. However, his initial excitement quickly faded, and he reverted back to his old ways as the pregnancy progressed. A man found herself torn between her loyalty to Rhett and her love for her unborn child. Unbeknownst to the man, Rhett had started a relationship with another student named Sarah Mohammed. Sarah had always desired Rhett, so when he asked her out, she saw it as an opportunity. However, upon learning of Amman's pregnancy, Sarah's jealousy transformed into a vicious rage. Torn between the two women, Rhett ultimately chose Sarah, leaving a man to face her pregnancy alone. A man struggled with the breakup, but the arrival of her baby boy, Keenan, gave her strength. In March 2019, she gave birth to a healthy child, despite Rhett's absence during the birth and his continued emotional distance. However, the presence of their child only fueled Sarah's rage and jealousy. She found it unbearable that a man Rhett still had a connection through their baby and her resentment reached toxic new heights. Meanwhile, a man was completely engrossed in taking care of her baby, oblivious to the ominous presence lurking in the shadows. Despite no longer being in a romantic relationship, a man and Rhett managed to maintain a friendship and frequently cross paths. 
However, when Sarah discovered their continued connection, she was filled with anger and promptly ended her relationship with Rhett. Unwilling to let go, Rhett was determined to salvage their bond and arranged a lunch meeting with Sarah on Friday, May 3, 2019, hoping to convince her to stay with him. The following day, on May 4, 2019, 17-year-old Rhett visited a man's house while her mother was away, with Sarah waiting outside. Initially, Rhett appeared friendly as he caught up with a man and reminisced about old times. However, his demeanor suddenly shifted. He retrieved a large kitchen knife from his bag and launched a vicious attack on a man. A struggle ensued, but a man summoned her strength and managed to push him away, fleeing into the garden. Rhett relentlessly pursued her, continuing the assault by brazenly stabbing her in the face, neck, armpit, and back three times. As a man lay bleeding and fighting for her life, Red fled the scene and rendered vows with Sarah. The two embraced, engaged in conversation, and swiftly returned to Sarah's residence. Little did they anticipate that a man would survive. One of her brothers had witnessed her bleeding in the garden and rushed her to the hospital. Red's escape was short-lived as the police apprehended him at a bus stop, clutching two bags containing blood-stained clothing and a bloody knife. Now in custody, Red faced intense questioning from the authorities. Through his responses and their subsequent investigation, the police pieced together the sequence of the events. The tragic incident was set in motion during Red and Sarah's lunch meeting on Friday, May 3, 2019. Sarah's fury over Red's continued involvement with Iman led her to demand the ultimate proof of his love and commitment, the murder of Iman. She wanted him to go to great lengths to win back her affection. Rhett's phone records indicated that following the meeting, he had conducted online searches regarding asphyxiation and the potential penalties for murder. The investigation uncovered that Sarah had persistently pressured Rhett, bombarding him with numerous text messages instructing him to document his actions and share the footage as proof. Fortunately for a man, Rhett's attempts at executing the plan had failed and her family promptly rushed her to the hospital. A mind underwent multiple surgeries and remained hospitalized for a duration of four days, as she had sustained severe injuries from a total of 15 stab wounds. The doctors confirmed that considering the severity of the assault, she was incredibly fortunate to have survived. During the police interrogation, a man recounted that Rhett had posed disturbing questions during his visit on that fateful day. He inquired whether she would be willing to end her own life for him, if he should end hers, and how he should go about it. Red confessed to a man that he was being coerced into terminating her life, claiming that failure to comply could result in harm to his family. He even requested her assistance in faking a strangulation, suggesting that she apply makeup to her neck to simulate the appearance of a choke mark, which he intended to photograph. Reluctantly, a man agreed and proceeded to apply the makeup, closing her eyes as he captured the staged image. However, upon opening her eyes, she was met with a horrifying sight. Rhett holding a large kitchen knife. Filled with fear, a man attempted to dial the emergency services, but he forcefully prevented her from doing so. Fearing for her life, she implored him to leave. A struggle ensued, and summoning her strength, a man managed to escape from the room and flee into the garden. It was there that Rhett ultimately attacked her with the knife, inflicting over 15 stab wounds to her head, neck, and back. Following the savage assault, Red swiftly fled the scene, having prepared a change of clothes and sneakers to discard the blood-stained attire he had worn during the attack, highlighting the extent of his premeditation. When he was apprehended, the items he had in his possession included a kitchen knife, a green sports bag, and clothing and sneakers stained with blood. Additionally, there was an open pack of wipes, some of which had been used, presumably for cleaning the knife. Shortly after, 17-year-old Sarah Mohammed was arrested. Her phone was seized, revealing messages urging Rhett to be cautious about leaving behind any DNA evidence, as it could lead to imprisonment. Furthermore, the messages requested that he record the attack so that she could view it before deleting the evidence and disposing of the phone. The detectives also discovered that while Sarah was waiting outside Iman's house, she bombarded Rhett with over 50 texts actively encouraging his actions. Among these messages, one stood out, stating, Why are you taking so long? 
Hurry up and do it. What followed were a series of chilling messages that exposed the dark side of Rhett and Sarah's relationship. In response to Sarah, Rhett wrote, I did it to prove I love you. There was no other way to keep you. Sarah replied, I know there wasn't. I'm going to protect you at all costs. Shockingly, she even offered to assist him in obtaining a new identity, assuring him, I would have done the same for you. Investigators were appalled that high school teenagers could harbor such sinister thoughts. Rhett Cardi Shaw was charged with attempted murder and possession of a dangerous weapon, while his girlfriend, Sarah Mohammed, was charged with intentionally encouraging and assisting in the commission of murder. Initially, Rhett was also charged with assault based on the hospital's examination of Iman, but this charge was dropped when Iman confirmed that it was consensual. Prior to the trial, Sarah Mohammed changed her name to Cairo Mori Akihiro. The trial took place in December 2019 at Manchester Crown Court, where a courageous Iman Nasser confronted her attackers as she provided her testimony, recounting how the incident unfolded. On that fateful day, Iman received a phone call from Rhett informing her that he was en route to her residence. At that moment, she was sound asleep inside the house, while her sisters were busy preparing food in the kitchen. Meanwhile, her mother had stepped out with her newborn baby. When Red arrived at her doorstep, he carried a green plastic bag and wore black gloves. Inside the bag, there lay a black Adidas hoodie and matching trousers. Red claimed that his intention was to donate these clothes to charity, but a man expressed her desire to examine them, which sparked an argument between them. Subsequently, when she retreated to her room, Red followed her and settled into the gaming chair, drawing closer to her. A man testified in court that he began touching her thighs and chest, kissing her neck, nose, and face, almost forcing himself upon her. Although she felt angered by his behavior, she eventually succumbed, and the two engaged in intimate relations within her bedroom. Later, their conversation took a disturbing turn as Rhett broached the topic of her demise. According to a man, Rhett gazed into the mirror and made unsettling remarks, including threats towards his own family. Frightened, she called out to her sister, but Rhett swiftly silenced her, assuring her that he had no harmful intentions. Suddenly, the tone of their conversation shifted once more as his phone incessantly beat with a barrage of text messages. He emphasized the seriousness of his threats. In response, a man threatened to contact someone unless he revealed the contents of the messages. However, Rhett attempted to conceal the messages from her as he perused them. These messages, sent by Cairo Mori, also known as Sarah, were the final catalyst. The situation escalated from emotional distress to outright violence as Rhett launched an attack on Iman with a knife. Iman also provided insights into Cairo Mori's life, describing her as a demonic girl with a fascination for dark and gothic themes. She labeled Cairo Mori as a manipulative and delusional teenager who could not accept that a man had been involved with Rhett prior to her. A man believed that Cairo Mori had been stalking her on social media, which contributed to her feelings of insecurity. A man's testimony was filled with intense emotions as she recounted the harrowing experience she had endured. She described how her life had been completely transformed, struggling to find a sense of safety and even sleep at night. The daunting task of rebuilding her life now forced her to become a stay-at-home parent solely responsible for caring for her child. Shockingly, Iman did not receive any form of apology from the perpetrators, which deeply affected her. She expressed her frustration, highlighting that no one had considered the fact that her son was only two months old at the time and she had recently undergone a C-section at 35 weeks. Despite her powerful testimony, Cairo Mori, also known as Sarah, disagreed with the court's account of events. She maintained her innocence, claiming that she believed Rhett was planning to end his relationship with a man. Cairo Mori explained her messages as an attempt to have their breakup recorded on his phone as evidence of their separation. However, her explanation failed to sway anyone. Throughout the court proceedings, Cairo Mori was observed smiling and even laughing, displaying a complete lack of remorse. Both Rhett and Cairo Mori, who were 17 years old at the time of the trial, were ultimately found guilty of all charges. During the sentencing, Judge Alan Conrad QC highlighted the disturbingly narcissistic behaviors exhibited by Rhett and Cairo Mori 
expressing disappointment in Kara Moore's actions. The judge emphasized that the victim was an innocent girl whom Carol Mori had never even met and who had caused her no harm. Even the defense team expressed profound sadness over the tragic nature of the case, underscoring how the incomprehensible actions of these two teenagers had irreversibly damaged their own futures. Initially, the media was prohibited from disclosing their names due to their age. However, following their conviction and in response to requests from the press, Judge Alan Conrad C ordered that their identities be made public. Ahmad Nasser also chose to waive her anonymity rights, as she believed it was crucial for her story to be shared. On Friday, December 20, 2019, Rhett Cardi Shaw was sentenced to 16 years in prison for attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon. Kyra Mori Akihiro, previously known as Sarah Mohammed, has been sentenced to 16 years in prison for her involvement in encouraging and assisting a person to commit murder. Following the conviction of the teenagers, Detective Inspector Jennifer Tattersall from Greater Manchester Police commended a man's bravery and determination. She acknowledged the significant impact the traumatic event it had on the young woman who was left in a serious condition and praised her for coming forward to assist the police during the investigation. A man Nasser expressed her satisfaction with the outcome of the trial, stating that she achieved the results she desired. She also expressed gratitude towards the police for their assistance and support and voiced her hope for a brighter future. Despite justice being served, a man faces numerous challenges ahead. The incident has profoundly affected her perspective on life, leaving her in constant fear of potential harm. She disclosed that her family had relocated from Openshaw due to the traumatic incident and her deteriorating mental health. A man now struggles to trust others and relies on medication to cope with the lingering effects of her ordeal. Although a man's journey to recovery will be difficult, she remains determined to rebuild her life for the sake of her child. Her experience with a seemingly loving partner who turned violent serves as a reminder of the importance of vigilance and recognizing warning signs in relationships. As for the adequacy of the sentence given to Rhett and Cairo Mori, it is a matter open to interpretation and discussion. On the morning of December 10, 2017, Gary Bentley, a 33-year-old resident of Campbellsburg, Kentucky, woke up bright and early along with his lovely wife, Tasha, who was 34 years old, and their four-year-old son, Connor. Despite being married for five blissful years, Tasha had recently lost her job, which had left her feeling sad and miserable. The stress of finding a new job had taken a toll on her. However, on that particular day, Tasha returned from work in the evening only to discover that Gary had not been answering her calls or messages. As she approached their house, she noticed the garage door wide open and an eerie silence enveloping the premises. A sense of fear washed over Tasha as she realized that something was amiss. What had happened to Gary? Had he vanished without a trace, or was there a more troubling explanation for his absence? Camp Bellsburg, situated in Henry County, Kentucky, is a charming community adorned with farmhouse-style homes. Despite its tranquil ambience, it is conveniently located just 40 miles away from the bustling city of Louisville, offering its residents easy access to urban amenities. As of 2020, the population of Campbellsburg stood at 836, steadily increasing over the past two decades. The town is part of the Louisville metropolitan area, renowned for its cultural landmarks and icons. Notably, it is the hometown of the legendary boxer, Muhammad Ali, and serves as the venue for the prestigious Kentucky Derby. Additionally, Campbellsburg probably claims to be the birthplace of Kentucky Fried Chicken and is home to the University of Louisville and the esteemed Louisville Slugger Company, known for manufacturing baseball bats. Like any city, Campbellsburg is not immune to crime, but its crime rate of 1.66 per thousand residents remains relatively low compared to other areas in the region. In this idyllic community, Gary Bentley resided with his wife and son, cherishing the values of family. Born on August 31, 1984, in Louisville, Kentucky, Gary was the son of Gerald and Lisa Bentley. He held a deep bond with his younger sister, Amy, and embraced the importance of familial connections. From the very start, Gary displayed a genuine country boy spirit and reveled in the wonders of the great outdoors. He found joy in hunting 
fishing and immersing himself in the breathtaking beauty of the Kentucky landscape. Additionally, he had a talent for collecting guns, and his passion for the wilderness was only surpassed by his unwavering loyalty to his beloved sports team, the Kentucky Wildcats. As a young man, Gary pursued a career as an electrician and successfully graduated as a skilled member of the local Brotherhood IBE W. 369. In 2006, Gary's life took an unexpected turn when he crossed paths with Tasha Lynn Etherton, a nurse who was a year older than him. Tasha's outspoken and outgoing nature perfectly complemented Gary's quiet and laid-back personality, creating an undeniable connection between them. They dated for six years, establishing a strong foundation for their future together. Finally, in September 2012, Gary and Tasha exchanged vows, solidifying their lifelong commitment to each other. Their home in Campbellsburg was soon blessed with the arrival of their son, Connor, who quickly became the center of their universe. Gary proved to be an exceptional father, showering his son with love and attention. He delighted in chasing the little boy around the house and eagerly anticipated embarking on outdoor adventures with him. The family also cherished their vacations, including a memorable trip to Jamaica in 2016 with their friends Kevin and Amy Day. However, beneath the surface, cracks began to appear in their seemingly idyllic life. Tasha faced challenges at work, putting her job at risk. This uncertainty led to arguments during their vacation, and tensions escalated to the point where it strained Gary's relationship with his closest friend, Kevin. Upon returning home, the situation worsened as Tasha lost her job. Although she eventually found another job, her demeanor grew increasingly irritable and distant, adding further strain to their relationship. Despite these difficulties, Gary remained determined to salvage their marriage, unaware that fate had other plans in store. On December 10, 2017, at 6.54 p.m., Gary's father, Gerald, received a distressing phone call from Tasha, who sounded deeply concerned. Tasha recounted that Gary had failed to answer her calls and messages throughout the entire day. Upon returning home from work, she discovered the garage door wide open, which left her too frightened to enter the house. Concerned for her safety, Gerald drove to their residence in Campbellsburg. He cautiously entered the house and was warmly greeted by their dogs, but his calls for their son, Gary, went unanswered. Gerald proceeded through the house and eventually arrived at Gary's bedroom, where he was met with a horrifying sight. Gary lay motionless in bed, with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. Overwhelmed by the shocking scene, Gerald immediately dialed 911 for assistance. The paramedics and police from Henry County arrived promptly, but unfortunately, it was too late for Gary. He was pronounced dead at the scene, leaving Gerald devastated. The police discovered a single shell casing next to Gary's lifeless body. The positioning of the body indicated that Gary had been facing away from the bedroom door when the fatal shot was fired, suggesting a cold-blooded execution-style murder within his own home. This revelation stunned the police, especially considering the absence of any signs of forced entry or a break-in. Strangely, all of Gary's firearms were missing from the safe, yet nothing else appeared to have been taken, and the house remained untouched. However, during their search of the premises, the police stumbled upon a concealed stash of marijuana and cannabis seeds stored in jars, raising suspicions of a potential connection between the death and drug-related activities. Investigators noted that Gary owned several dogs who would typically alert or bark if an unfamiliar person entered the house, yet none of the neighbors reported hearing any commotion or barking sounds in the vicinity. It was evident that Gary himself had been caught off guard, as there were no signs of a struggle. This led investigators to believe that the perpetrator might have been someone known to the dogs, someone familiar with the Bentley family. As part of the investigation, Tasha was interviewed inside a patrol car. Tasha provided a detailed account of her interactions with Gary on the morning of his deer hunting trip. She mentioned attempting to contact him throughout the day, but received no response. Additionally, Tasha revealed that she had visited their friends Kevin and Amy earlier that day. During the conversation about their friends, Tasha accidentally revealed that Gary and Kevin had a heated argument during their trip to Jamaica, which resulted in Gary throwing a drink at Kevin. Based on this information, the police decided to interview Kevin as a person of interest in the case. However, Kevin was able to provide a solid alibi, 
leading the police to remove him from the suspect list. As is common in such investigations, the detectives shifted their focus to Tasha Bentley, the surviving spouse. Upon delving into their marital history, the police discovered a relationship filled with challenges and conflicts. The breaking point in their 10-year-long marriage occurred after their vacation in Jamaica in September 2016, when Tasha lost her job due to ongoing issues at work. Although her stress seemed to decrease after securing a new job, there were peculiar incidents involving her cars. In 2016, Tasha contacted her father-in-law, Gerald, claiming her car had broken down and she needed a ride. Strikingly, this was not the first time she found herself in such a situation. There were three separate incidents where her cars were intentionally set on fire, leading investigators to question if Tasha orchestrated these events for insurance claims. By 2017, the problems in Gary and Tasha's marriage had intensified. Gary's family and close friends began suspecting that Tasha might be involved in an extramarital affair. She frequently spent a significant amount of time on her phone, often claimed to be working late hours and appeared emotionally distant. This situation escalated to the point where Tasha started spending entire weekends away from Gary. Gerald made multiple attempts to address the concerning situation with his son, Gary. However, Gary consistently dismissed his family's worries and showed reluctance to discuss the issues in his marriage. One particular incident that stood out for Gary's family was the Thanksgiving holiday in November 2017, just a few weeks before Gary's untimely death. Gary's parents had hosted the holiday gathering at their residence in Louisville. During the celebration, Tasha, Gary's wife, seemed unusually eager to leave. After dinner, she excused herself, claiming she wanted to go shopping alone. However, she returned in the early hours of Black Friday without making any purchases. The following week, Tasha expressed her concerns to Lisa Bentley, her mother-in-law. She expressed her reluctance to attend the funeral, which immediately raised red flags for Amy. Amy sensed that there was more to the story, and her intuition proved to be correct. She disclosed to the authorities that Tasha had been engaged in an affair with a co-worker named Anthony. The situation had become so serious that Tasha had been planning to leave Gary and move in with Anthony in January 2018. Additionally, the police discovered that both Tasha and Gary had been researching life insurance policies. While Gary had reservations about the idea, Tasha had been advocating for a substantial $1 million policy. These revelations added further complexity to the intricate puzzle surrounding Gary's death. The detectives decided to delve deeper into the matter and made a startling discovery. They found that a newly acquired $1 million life insurance policy had been taken out in Gary's name, just four days before the tragic event occurred. Tasha had given her consent to this policy by using Gary's electronic signature. The police now possessed sufficient circumstantial evidence to regard Tasha as their primary suspect. On December 11, 2017, Tasha was summoned to the police station for an interview where she was interrogated about her relationship with Anthony. Initially, Tasha asserted that they were merely colleagues and friends, both inside and outside of work. However, as the interview progressed, she eventually confessed to having an affair with Anthony and planning to move in with him. The conversation then shifted to the contentious topic of the life insurance policy. Tasha vehemently denied any involvement in Gary's death, but the police harbored strong suspicions that she either personally shot him or hired someone to carry out the act. Tasha's narrative crumbled when investigators cautioned her about the potential loss of custody of her son. In an emotionally charged breakdown, she admitted to murdering Gary, but with a twist. She claimed that Gary had allegedly assaulted their four-year-old son, Connor, by throwing him onto the bed, hitting the wall, and repeatedly striking the child. Tasha asserted that she intended to intervene, but she became the target of Gary's violence as he kicked her. Hours later, while Gary was asleep in bed, Tasha used her personal Ruger firearm to deliver the fatal shot, implying that she acted in self-defense. Tasha further revealed that she emptied the gun safe in an attempt to make the crime appear as a failed robbery. She handed the firearms, including the murder weapon, a handgun with purple grips, to Anthony who stored them at his sister's residence in Louisville. The police briefly considered the possibility of Anthony being an accomplice, but after questioning him and verifying his alibi, 
he was cleared of all suspicion. The outcome of the case now depended on verifying Tasha's self-defense claim and determining whether Gary had indeed assaulted his son. The police conducted interviews with friends and family members, as well as sought advice from medical experts. They transported four-year-old Connor to Morton Children's Hospital in Louisville to assess him for signs of long-term abuse, but the investigation yielded a unanimous outcome. There was no evidence to indicate that Gary had inflicted harm upon his son. In fact, the information gathered portrayed Gary as a dedicated father, son, and husband who had never exhibited any violent tendencies towards anyone. However, it was discovered that Tasha had not only brutally murdered her sleeping husband, but had also fabricated a story about an assault in an attempt to mislead the authorities. Consequently, Tasha Bentley was promptly arrested and charged with the murder of Gary, as well as tampering with physical evidence. Additionally, she faced charges related to the possession and distribution of marijuana, as numerous jars of marijuana and cannabis seeds were found in their residence. Tasha Bentley pleaded guilty to her husband's murder on July 20, 2021, and on September 17, 2021, she received a sentence of 55 years in prison. Currently, she is incarcerated at the Kentucky Correctional Institute for Women, with her earliest possible parole date set for November 20th. 2037, according to her inmate records. Following the sentencing, both Gary and Tasha's families engaged in a custody battle over their son, Connor. After the murder, Tasha took Connor to Bullock County, Kentucky, and entrusted him to Scarlett Etherton, who was later revealed to be Tasha's great aunt. In July 2018, the Bullock County Family Court granted permanent custody of Connor to Etherton. However, the Bentleys and their attorney, Louis Winner, have claimed that they were not adequately informed about the custody hearing and are now seeking to overturn the custody order. They argue that they have been treated unfairly in Bullock County, citing Etherton's previous role as a deputy court clerk, which they believe may have influenced the proceedings. Additionally, the Bentleys have raised concerns about their grandson Connor's well-being, alleging that Etherton violated a court order by removing him from therapy and discussing the crime with them. Despite the legal complexities involved, the Bentleys remain steadfast in their pursuit of sole custody for Connor. At the age of 10, Connor continues to grapple with profound emotional distress. He has displayed signs of trauma, often assuming the persona of his late father, Gary, and harboring deep-seated resentment towards his mother, Tasha. When Tasha attempted to arrange a visit with Connor at the correctional facility, he repeatedly expressed disinterest, stating, why would I want to visit the person who destroyed my life? Gary Bentley's tragic story serves as a stark reminder of how financial greed can drive individuals to commit heinous acts, even at the expense of a loved one's life. Now the question arises, was justice truly served for Gary Bentley? And do you agree with the 55-year sentence handed down to Tasha?